Sorry for the business. So um, welcome back. I hope uh, everyone here has uh, had a wonderful fall break. So uh, first, I uh, uh, need to uh, announce a few things. First, uh, one of our TM, uh, Joyce, uh, she has some personal reasons and uh, left uh, uh, the university and she'll never come back. So uh, uh, during the fall break, I have to find another uh, TA. So his name is uh, uh, Jun Luo Wang, and uh, he will uh, he will take the office hour and sit from 10 to 11:30, uh, and uh, in the same uh, few. So I have made an announcement in campus and also uh, updated the uh, course webpage. So uh, please uh, be aware of the, the, the change of the time. But but now we still have the uh, office hour every weekday. Um, except that on Wednesday we uh, switched the time from uh, switch time to be from uh, 10:30 to 10 to 11:30, and uh, he will also watch the cameras and try to answer the questions. So this is the uh, this, uh, this is the first thing. And second thing, uh, I have uh, I've gone through um, the feedback I collected uh, the last lecture, I mean right before the right before the fall break. So uh, I, car I carefully uh, read through all every words that's on the although I have only collected less than half of the students' uh, feedback here five five represent. So I just uh, listed a few, uh, I listed the most uh, uh, representative uh, comments or feedbacks. I want to give an explanation or I want, to, I want to mention that something I will adjust accordingly, but something I need to emphasize. The, I need to emphasize the goal of this course, and also uh, why uh, why we get this kind of feedback. Uh, uh, right? So first, uh, 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 one of the most uh, complaints about the insufficient background. Um, well, uh, this course is, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, this course of graduate class. So uh, uh, we assume that you have uh, enough background in basic calculus and linear algebra. Uh, of, of course, matrix derivative uh, uh, sounds like uh, strange or unfamiliar to uh, some of you. And uh, I don't remember some students said, said that because matrix derivative is, is not is, is taught no elsewhere. So I should be I, 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 uh, so I, I should spend time teaching this. So one well, assume because we are grad students, right? More many of you are PhD students, so you should be able to self-study. So I have pointed out the uh, very good references about matrix derivative, and uh, especially Tom Minkas reference. This is a very succinct uh, reference. You just follow the derivations here. It's very good practice. And then I give you a very good dictionary. This matrix cookbook is downloaded. Uh, it's everywhere in the web. So nearly every Everyone who wants to use matrix derivative will, 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 will use that as a basic tool, a dictionary for that. So, but if you still, like you, 
difficult to apply matrix derivative uh, techniques. Uh, um, so uh, let me just make a survey right now. So how many of you still feel uh, difficult to apply a matrix derivative? Okay, so probably we will arrange uh, some uh, special class to let our TM to uh, to go through the matrix derivatives. Does it make sense? So we can walk through a few examples so that you can you have a sense about how to apply it. It's, it's really mechanical. I mean, if you know the basic rules, it just it's really mechanical. And what you do is just look up look up the dictionary. If you forgot the details, look up dictionary and, and replace all the formulas and, and do a simplification to a simplification until you, you find a reasonable uh, formula. And some uh, and uh, uh, one to one textbook chapter. Uh, I was I was a bit surprised that uh, uh, I, I I saw some complaints about like there's no there's lack of uh, uh, one to one textbook textbook uh, chapter in, the, in my course. Actually, uh, there is. So if you take a look at the uh, If you take a look at the uh, uh, course web page, so uh, if you look at this this chart, this column reading materials, uh, those are exactly the text chapter uh, which cover what we have discussed in the class. So um, first, first, uh, uh, there is no requirement that uh, uh, any specific class must have some one-to-one -one correspondence in some textbook. This is not, this is not a specific requirement. But here, I want to add some. Part. I want to add such, such kind of chapter to help you. Like, if you want to, you want more details, or you want more in-depth reading, uh, you can point. You can find out those uh, chapters and redo it. But those are exact one-to-one correspondence. And also, I give the link. Here. You just go. You just uh, click into the link. This is a free book. It's not a. It's a valid free book. It's valid for book. You can download it from your from the website. And just looking into the chapter, so I I need to I need to mention that those chapters uh, they cover a little bit more than what I have discussed in the class. And if you want like more in depth read, just read them. And but uh, basically, uh, I don't want to increase your workload. So if you just uh, click into these links to download the slides and follow the directions exactly. From what what I have done in the class, that should be more than sufficient. But if you want to look more, uh, feel free to to click this click this chapter to to read into it. Sometimes uh, uh, some topic I might uh, uh, I may jump out of this textbook, the pattern recognition machine learning book, but I will point out a reference here. Say when we talk about uninformed priors, I point out Jordan slice. It's from Berkeley. Uh, this slice give you a more uh, give you a more comprehensive uh, introduction about the un uninformative part. So feel free to read them. Okay. And also, um, if you, I mean, if you uh, sometimes you may feel like uh, uh, you you forgot some like basic knowledge about linear algebra, and listed in the uh, information. So this is this guy. Information, information uh, tab. So those are textbooks. Most of them are downloadable from the website. So you can either find out your old textbook in your uh, undergrad school, or just look into this and search for the keywords. So I believe I provided I have provided enough resources. Um, so if you find difficult, if you if you if you cannot find anything, you, I I suggest you first uh, look into my course webpage and then search for Google. That will save a lot of time. Does it make sense? So, um, let's go back to the... so uh, some of you, uh, some of some of students uh, complain that there are less practical problems and they want more programming portion. That's a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, I'll explain you why. Uh, uh, seemingly, in the first uh, half of semester, we don't have so much like practical problems because uh, because uh, if you take a look at our uh, 
uh, schedule of the schedule of the lectures. Uh, you see that actually in the first month, in the first month we are spent all the time in reviewing those uh, foundations. So mathematical foundations result telling result going through this we can now tell more uh, about those uh, advanced models. So when we talk about mathematical conditions, there's no practical problems. Right? And, uh, and then we talk about like uh, 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 generalized linear models and probabilistic regression models. Those are powerful tools to describe the models. But we haven't, we haven't yet addressed the computational issues. That's our major topic uh, uh, after this class. Uh, how do we conduct efficient approximation inference in all, all kinds of ways. So uh, don't worry. In the remaining half a semester, you will see uh, much reduced analytic problems, but much, much more, work, uh, much more workload on the practical problems. You are required to implement uh, several well-known um, basic models. You have to deal with uh, real data. You have to debug it. You have to encode all kind of uh, mathematical derivations into a Python, Python or R or MATLAB programming, and you need to make it work. So don't worry about that. And uh, well, on, on the other hand, um, uh, this uh, this uh, like uh, uh, complaints along with these practical uh, problems, like too obstructive or too difficult. Well, um, uh, I, I have to I have to admit that uh, our course is not that like a complete. Uh, this is a graduate. Again, it's a part of that class. And also the goal of this class is not to is not like kick off events to you know to 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 to, to, to stimulate your curiosity to to the science world. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a, it's actually to introduce all the mathematical foundations about the probabilistic modeling and also um, help you to gain the capability to de develop your own probabilistic model. So uh, uh, you don't need to worry about whether what I'm teaching here is like uh, cutting edge research. Um, I can tell you that as long as you follow all those topics, uh, uh, it's very easy for you to dive into the cutting edge research. So those are all the necessary topics you need to learn if you want to know what is the front research is doing right now. Especially like if you if you do not know what is variational inference, uh, you will see a lot of fancy uh, formulas in like basic neural networks and variational uh, encoders, such kind of stuff. So, uh, when you look at what is variation inference, what is variation evidence, lower bound, they say, okay, this is really, really naive. So, um, so yes, it is kind of abstractive. It's kind of difficult, but uh, uh, it is designed to be like this. Okay, but I will put practical problems, and you will see the practical problems uh, uh, in the remaining homework assignments. Okay, and. Uh, yeah, workload is too heavy. Uh, well, um, yeah, uh, I'm kind of uh, trying to. I'm trying to reduce the workload. So since the homework, uh, I think homework two, right? So you, you can imagine, you can see that I have uh, reduced the ne number of the problems, uh, but I increased the number of the bonus problems. So I want to encourage the. I want to satisfy the ambitious students, but I. I, I but at the same time, I don't want to. Uh, cost you too much of a time to do that. If some, somebody tell me, okay, I have to work like five to six hours a, a day and, and seven days a week, then that's not that's that's kind of like too heavy. Um, but again, like we have some uh, strict uh, requirement that you need to gain that kind of capability. That means uh, at least the minimum amount of work you have to do that. Okay, and uh, 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 as you have seen, uh, homework uh, three, uh, I think the workload is. Is much smaller, right? How many of you have started with some three? Okay. And uh, uh, I think that I think that set of problems are are, are more straightforward, and uh, it's not that hard. But but I still include several bonus uh, questions. Uh, if you're if you're interested in that, you can try to solve that. Um, but in the following two homeworks, we have, we still have the two homework assignments. Uh, uh, if you see the analytical problems, uh, there are actually some uh, pre-step for you to fulfill or implement 
the, 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 the model inference algorithms. So don't don't be upset about that. If you do that, I mean problems that you're ready to implement your algorithms. Does it make sense? And uh, disconnect between homework and lecture. I feel I feel kind of uh, uh, quite surprised uh, if you have a such kind of feeling like like you feel like a large disconnection between homework and uh, lecture. So if you if you have such such kind of strong feeling, um, uh, come to the office hour and talk to me. Uh, so basically, I can tell you how I design the homework problems. So basically, I want you guys to follow lecture. That's why I encourage you guys to come to the lecture and follow my derivation. I give you I show the details as much as possible, but I and no one can guarantee that you can follow every detail in the lecture, right? So after class, you should uh, follow the derivations from the lecture. You can you can just print out your slides or just watch the screen and just uh, write down every derivations. You that will uh, reinforce your understanding of your lectures and also deepen understand uh, your your lectures. And after that, all the homeworks are based on extension or extended thoughts about the lectures we have discussed in class. So if you, every time, if you, if, you, if you do not review the slides, if you do not review the lectures, then, like every time we have homeworks, you first search the keywords on the lectures and want to find the answer, that won't work. So I won't give you, I won't give the problems like if you search the keywords, you can find the answer. This is not, this is not my style to design homeworks. So you, the, the homeworks can be finished based on, on your fully understanding the lecture content. It's not like there are a copy of some content to finish the homework. And if you still feel like difficult in that, then you can come to the office server. Or the last way like search in the Google or search for the post. I don't I don't object that you guys to search on Google and uh, um, but but do not try to do that from scratch. And do not try to do that at, at the very beginning without any thinking. Um, there might be some like overlapping between the problems I design and the, some textbook uh, problems. I do not. I never intentionally do that. Actually, I, I, I will try to avoid such kind of situation in the, in the future. The reason is just want you to uh, think of, to really understand what I have discussed in class, and then you can try to do the homework. So again, if you if you feel like largely uh, the homework problems and the lecture content largely disconnected, uh, that's a that's not a good signal. So uh, 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 if you if you follow my suggestion, if you still feel such kind of disconnection, uh, do not hesitate. Come to the, come to my office hour, and I'll try to figure out a problem and uh, help you. Does it make sense? And slow down the pace and too much content. So while, uh, again, this is this course, as I emphasized in the beginning, is kind of challenging. So I, I try to uh, convey the main uh, concepts and uh, all the necessary topics. Uh, about the uh, 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 progressive modeling. Um, um, if I slow down the topic, because this 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 whole progressive modeling, uh, progressive machine learning branch is so large, so uh, I I can only pick up the key concepts and key topics and all the fundamental techniques. Uh, I think is necessary to deliver to you. Uh, but if, but if you still feel like the pace is too fast and the, the, the content is too much, uh, there could be some some issue. There could be some issue. So uh, if you if you cannot adapt to such kind of uh, pace, so come to my office hour. We need to figure out the plan. Okay, any any questions so far? Okay, so uh, that's the that's about the uh, uh, feedback and thanks for your feedback and uh, hopefully our we need to work hard to uh, uh, to to go through the. Beginning half of the semester, and hope everybody will find it useful after after this uh, whole uh, <coughs> class. So now, um, let us uh, go back to the topics. So let's see. I want to emphasize again. If you have any problems, uh, just come to the office hour. So uh, uh, many issues when I found, uh, I can only find in the office hour because in the class I thought okay, uh, quite a few 
excellent students like before the lecture fell off. It, can, it gave me a kind of like, a, maybe it's an illusion, maybe it's not. Like everybody goes well. But, but uh, if you think it's really difficult, you should let me know. And I can adjust accordingly. Otherwise, I think, okay, looks like everybody uh, feels comfortable. Everybody is more than that. Right? So just let me know. And I'm just complaining uh, constantly. Go back to the holistic uh, market model of interest uh, in the last lecture. So, uh, in the last lecture, we introduced the uh, sum product algorithm. Right? Sum product algorithm is uh, used to efficiently calculate the marginal probability of one variable or several variables uh, uh, in a graphing model. Right? Uh, we uh, explain the sum product algorithm uh, in the factor graph. Right? What is factor graph? So factor graph is a kind of bipart graph. Right? So you have uh, two pairs of nodes. Uh, one pair of nodes represent the uh, random variable uh, in your graphing model, right? A pair of, uh, uh, another pair of nodes are called factors, uh, which represent the terms in your drawing probability. Right? So suppose it's the x1, x2, to uh, xn, right? So uh, suppose your drawing probability is written as like uh, Psi 1, 2, 1 plus 2 times psi 2 x n, psi 2 x, blah, 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 right? So the first term is a factor, uh, which connects x1 and x2. So this is psi 1, 2, right? A second, second factor is psi 2 n, which connects x2 and x n. So this is a second factor. So this is a very, uh, uh, very uh, convenient and intuitive representation of your drawing probability. So given any drawing probability, your, you can directly draw the factor graph. Or given the factor graph, you can directly write down your uh, drawing probability. Right? So uh, for convenience, we, Ill, uh, we explain our sum of that algorithm on, uh, in a factor graph representation. But uh, actually, the, the sum of that algorithm can be uh, carried on other graphs, like in our original undirected graph models. Uh, the same thing. Then, uh, what is the key idea of the sum product algorithm? Yes. Why do we change the order of sum products? Yes, reduce competition, right? So, um, suppose we want, we want to compute the marginal uh, distribution. So let me just uh, erase this algebra. So, Suppose we want to compute a marginal distribution for a variable x. Right? Um, it is equal to marginalize, marginalize out all the other variables. So marginalize means you just do the summation. You do the summation of the drawn probability. So this is the big X. Big X represents all the other variables. And you marginalize out all the other variables. Big X excluding the small X is our target variable. So according to our um, uh, factor graph definition, this drawn probability can be factorized as a product of the factors. Right? So it can be written as a so you have a set of uh, factors. Each factor is associated with a set of uh, a subset of random variables. So the naive competition for the marginalization will be like this. Right? It, will be, it will be very uh, in, inefficient. Why? Because we first uh, do the we first do the product operation and then do the sum. And what's the consequence? The consequence is that like if I have a two factors, so x a and uh, x b, and suppose 
the two success of the variables x and xp are now already. So you can imagine like if I do the summation over x and xp of the product of x and xp. So when I vary the setting of xp, the configurations of xp, uh, the value of fa is not changed. Meaning that every time when I when I calculate different value of FB, I need to recalculate this FA from scratch and then multiply this, this new value of FB and then do the summation. So if uh, if I have like a 100 times uh, 100 configurations of of uh, XP, like, and for and I need to recompute this same value of FB 100 times, multiply with it and sum over all of this. Uh, so it's very inefficient. A natural way to see the computation is that why not we first uh, do the summation over FB, and do the summation over FA, and then apply them together. So basically like this, right? So I first uh, do the summation of FA over XA, summation over XB, FB, and then do the product. That will save a lot of computation. So this rule is called distributive law, right? So everybody knows from the from the from the primary school, uh, primary, uh, school right? So some product, as the name suggested, is just trying to uh, do as much sub operation as possible before the product. That's why it's called sub product. So sub product is originally defined on the tree structure graph you know, meaning that if I if my graph you know my factor graph is tree structure, some product always guaranteed an uh, exact computation or exact result. So, so here we just uh, spent a few minutes to get a key idea on that. We won't go through the details of how to write a massive custom proposal for some product. So basically, if uh, our target variable is x, because it's a tree structure variable, a tree structure factor graph, right? So I can put x as a root of our graph. And we know that x is connected to a few factors, right? So remember, this is a tree. That means each factor will be rooted uh, as a subtree, right? So you can imagine, like, uh, in each subtree, there are a bunch of uh, variables. But the key observation is that the variables in different subtrees are, are not overlapping. They're disconnected. If they are connected, that means there is a, a cycle in the tree, right? It's not it's not valid. Okay. So we can denote the product. So remember when we compute this, when we compute this, we can denote the product inside each subtree by uh, one term. Say, uh, say this is fs. I can denote it as uh, fs, x, xs, right? Xs are all the variables. Uh, inside the subtree with fs as the root. Because we connect the x, so we can <coughs> put the uh, product inside the subtree by a function of x and xx. So then our drawn probability can be written as a product over all the factors connecting to your x, right? And uh, each item is uh, as x. This is a job for this. And if you want to calculate the marginal distribution of x, you just uh, marginalize out all the variables. Big x represents all the variables. Right? So this is actually your partition of product according to the subtrees. Each subtree is rooted by um, a factor. So then the key observation is that, just like the simple case we just mentioned, right? Remember, all the variables inside different subtrees, they are not overlapping with each other. That means we do not need to uh, first capture the product again and again and do the summation. Right? We can move the summation inside in each subtree. That means we can switch the uh, order of the sum and 
hurdle. That means, okay, I can do, I can first uh, do the summation inside each subtree, and then do the product outside. That's it. And then naturally we define the summation inside each subtree as a message from the factor, which is the root of the subtree, to the variable. So that's why, we, that's how we define the message. You will have s to x and x. So remember, this is a function of x. Because you sum over all the variables inside the subtree. That's our first uh, step to define message from the uh, factor node to a variable node, which, which is essentially just the sum over the product inside the whole subtree. Okay. And then we look into how uh, to compute the summation inside each subtree, which is a uh, which is a message, right? So by doing this, we can first uh, look into so suppose we look at this subtree rooted with FS, right? So the summation uh, inside this subtree is actually a message from FS to X. So if we take a look at this, we know this subtree can be full of partition. By another set of subtrees, right? Because each factor fs will connect to uh, another uh, set of random variables. So it could be like x1, x2, xm, x big F. So again, because this is a tree structure, so each x m variable here, rooted with a, a random variable, will determine a subtree. But the root now is a, a random variable rather than a factor. Okay. So again, we can denote all the product inside each subtree here by say a g term like g um, x. S. The XMS just means like I root all the variables inside each subtree rooted with XM and I connect to the XM. Right? So, and then how do, we, how do I compute the summation over the total tree, the product inside the total tree? So just do the decomposition. Right? So this one equals equals to what? I first multiply the factor fs x with x1 to x big f, right? Because this factor connects to all the variables here, x and the x1 to x big f. And then with each variable connecting to fs other than x, it also determines a subtree, right? So multiply the product associate or inside the subtree, so it will be a product over the subtree, so h will be a term, g, x, m, s, and so on, right? So these g terms just represent the product inside each subtree, with root being each variable connecting to f, s. So here, in outside, we just uh, do the summation for XS. So XS, including X1 to XM, and also the variables inside each subtree, with rooted, rooted being, with roots being X1 to X big F, right? So now, again, we use the, we need to consider for the, uh, uh, for the, for the efficiency. Right? So again, because each subtree, I mean, rooted with those variables, they are not overlapping at all. That means, at least for the summation inside the subtree, they could be independent and in parallel. So that means we can move part of the summation. We cannot move the whole, the total summation inside the product. We can only move part of them inside, inside the uh, product. That means we can first do the summation over each subtree here, and then outside we still need to sum over x1 to xm. Right? 
So the key idea here is that I partially move the summation inside the product. So inside each subtree here, I first uh, do the summation over XMS. Remember, XMS represents all the variables inside the subtree rooted with uh, uh, XM and connected to FS. And outside, I multiply with this factor. But in outside, I still need to sum over x1, the xm, right? Because f is associated with uh, x, x1 to xm. So you see, in this part, we just uh, partially move the summation inside the uh, product. But doing this can still save a lot of competition. Right? So then we define the summation inside this subtree. So this is the XM, right? Inside this subtree, subtree rooted with a variable node has a message from a variable node to factor. Node. So this is how we define a message from a variable node. That's how we define the two types of message. One is from a factor node to a variable node. The other is from a variable node to a factor node. And if you keep uh, digging how to compute this one, we'll, we'll have uh, the uh, 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 rule to compute that two types of messages. So I will, I will repeat what we have discussed uh, previously. So basically, from a factor node to a variable node, this is the way we compute the message. So this is a factor node fs and to a variable node x. Right? How do I do that? We first uh, we multiply the factor value. So it's a function of x and all the other variables of connecting to fs other than x. We is the message from all the other variables uh, to the fs. And it's sum over all the other variables x1 and xm to get the message from fs to x. This is a rule to compute the message from a factor node to a variable node. And how do you compute the message from variable node to a factor node? This, become, this becomes much straightforward. If you want to compute the message from variable node xm to fs, just multiply all the other messages from the factors neighboring x and s. So that means you just multiply this message with this message with this message. And then to capture all the messages, you just alternatively um, apply the two rules until you finish the all when you finish the computation of uh, the message from uh, every node uh, to every factor node to the neighboring variable node and every variable node to its neighboring factor node. Of course, we need to uh, uh, we need to specify the initial message. What is the initial message? If a variable node only connects to one factor node, we will compute the message from this variable node to the factor node. Its message is simply set to one. If a factor node only connects to one variable node, when we compute the message from this factor node to the variable node, it's just the factor itself. Now we have a boundary condition, right? So with appropriate uh, ordering, we should be able to compute all the messages, all, all the messages across the, uh, the, the factor graph. And we uh, mentioned uh, the uh, uh, protocol to compute message passing scheme. So basically, it's, it's kind of a two-pass uh, process. So first, we need to pick up an arbitrary node as the root. And we, we compute and propagate messages from the lead nodes to the root. So basically, if I have a, a message, a tree, something like this, right? So the first, uh, First, I start with the 
leave the computer message from this <laughs> upwards to the root. This is the first step. And the second pass, I distribute the message from the root to the bottom, to the leaves. So the message will be flow in this way until it reaches a uh, every leaflet. So following this protocol, uh, you're, you're guaranteed to be comfortable at every step. That means you won't be embarrassed uh, at some stage that when you, when you want to compute the message and your dependent message are not available. Okay. So uh, if you have started with uh, homework uh, 3, uh, there's a bonus question asking you to prove that why this message passing protocol is uh, consistent uh, always. So you can use induction method to do that. So <clears throat> after the message passing is done, how to compute the marginals uh, is pretty simple. You just multiply uh, all the message, all the incoming message for a variable node and do the normalization as, uh, uh, as necessary. And sometimes if we have some value of the running variables being observed, how can we conduct the sum product algorithm? An idea? You mentioned in the last class, right? So uh, sometimes, for example, you can have like a, a graphing model, like you have a 10 uh, running variables, but you have x1, x2, and x3 are observed. I want to compute the Fourier distribution of x4 given x1, 2, and 3. How can I do that? I, I do not want to use base rules to compute that. It's, it's, it's invisible, right? But I know x1, x2, and x3 must be a base, right? How can I do that? Uh, I can still do that by simply multiplying the factor which involves any observed variable with an indicator function. So, so suppose uh, there's two factors involve uh, x1 So these two factors uh, which involve x1, right? I know x1 is observed, it should be fixed. So I just multiply this factor with an indicator function. So suppose x1 is, a, a, is observed as a 1, right? That's it. I just multiply all the factors which associate those observed variables by an indicator function which specify which specify that they must take this value. That means that you can enumerate x1. But when you enumerate x1 to be other values, to be the values other than the values is they observe, the factor is simply zero. Then you do the summation, it, it is equal to is equivalent to do your sum nothing, right? And then you do the same thing. And then when you, you get all message, you multiply them together into normalization, um, you get the posterior distribution. So uh, we, we have also uh, gone through a, a detailed example of some product algorithm. So this is a very simple example. I highly recommend you guys to uh, follow the example to, to write down all those uh, uh, calculation steps uh, by yourself. Uh, in this way, you can fully understand the message passing in protocol, uh, how the three steps uh, are carried. So I will, I will repeat this uh, again. So um, so here I want to uh, show you a piece of the pseudocode to implement this. So although this looks like a, a kind of complicated procedure, but when you implement with your Python or C++ or whatever, it's pretty straightforward. So as long as you have some experience in doing like tree traversal, when you're doing a data structure class, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So basically, step one, you're going to pick up a root node x and arrange the graph into a tree. This is a tree construction procedure. It's quite, quite standard for, 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 for data structure class, right? And then in the step two, so remember, this is our root node x, right? So step two is trying to collect all the messages from the leaves to the root. So I'm going to implement with a recursive calling 
of the subprogrammers of the app. So basically, I enumerate all the child factors at the member access variable. So all, all its child factors, all its children are factors, right? I'm going to call the uh, subprogram flag, flag the message from the leaves and send it to X. That means, okay, I'm going to first uh, flag the message from the leaves uh, until we arrive at this particular factor. And then, with those messages ready, I pack a message from this factor to the variable. This idea. And after doing this, I do the step three, another pass. It's called distribute, because all the messages are connected to the root, right? Now I want to distribute them from the root to the leaves. So, <clears throat> again, sorry. Those are all, all the assumptions. Again, I, I'm going to enumerate all the shelf factor, but this time I will distribute the message recursively until they arrive at the leaves. That's the idea. But how, how do we implement and collect and distribute uh, sub programs? Right? That depends on the recursive quality. So let us first look at the, uh, uh, the, 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 the sub program called uh, collect. So we have two types of collect functions. The first type function to uh, um, uh, when the root node is a uh, factor, you want to collect message from its shell variable to the factor. And second type of the collect function is when the root node is a uh, variable, we will want to collect a, a message uh, from this child factor to the variable. So you see, uh, in our uh, step two, the main program, we collect, uh, we, we call the collect, we'll collect a message from factor to the variable, right? But, but if you want to implement them uh, completely comprehensively, you need to implement these two versions. So let us look at how to implement them. Uh, right? so, First, remember this is a recursive program. When you do a recursive program, you always need to specify the, the boundary condition when you need to stop. Right? So, I want to collect message from variable node to a factor node. So, if x is leave, it means that I need to stop. Right? I don't know. I have arrived at the bottom left. I don't know if you. There is no leaves on leaves. Right? So, I can just stop. I just uh, return. Message one. This is according to our definition of message customer. When, when a variable only connects to one factor, the message from this variable to factor is one. This is the boundary condition. If it is not, the lead nodes, that means that x is in the intermediate level. So that means x can also connect to another set of uh, shell factors, right? And just go through those shell factors. Suppose any one after child factors are G. Then what I do is uh, first I collect the message from this uh, child factor to X. And then when I collect all the message from the child factor to variable X. And then I multiply them together to get a message from X to F. This is the rule we will compute to the message from variable to factor node, right? We just multiply the message from all the other factor nodes together. That's it. And then how do we collect the message from a factor node to a variable node? That goes to a, our second version of the program, right? So the second version of the program is just a, a flag program just to, to flag message from a factor node to a variable. So again, we need to specify the initial condition, right? A boundary condition. If F itself is leave, we do not need to 
recursive clap and more. We stop here and we return the message to the, the factor itself. If it's not, that means F is still connecting to a, a, a set of a child variables. What should we do? And here. Yeah, collect each one for each one of those, right? So we still do the recursive recursive calling. It's kind of like mutual uh, recursive calling. So I go through all the child variables and see on that. I'm sure we know this XG. I just collect message from XG to F. When I collect all, all of them, of course, this collection uh, procedure will recursively call another set of calls. And when, when I've done that, I use this rule to compute message. Remember how do we compute message from the factor of the variable? I multiply the, uh, the factor itself with all the message from the neighboring nodes to the factor itself and marginalize all. So, so then you can see like these two types of clack program, just recursive calling each other until uh, the boundary conditions are met, and then finish everything. Any questions so far? I think it's straightforward if you have like, any uh, experience in data structure. Right? This is kind of, it's very similar to like tree transversal procedure, right? If you have a like a, a, you have you have a written program like uh, in order tree search or first order or post order tree search it starts with me. But if you if you feel confused about that, like, don't worry about that. You are not required to implement this algorithm in practice problems. I decided to remove the practice problems for for some of that family. But you have you should have a sense on that. Right? Um, like years after you want to implement such an algorithm. You can just you can just finish by following this uh, pseudo code. It's a straightforward. And then distribute uh, the distribute procedures is very similar. So again, you have to consider two types of distribute procedures. First, like your root node is a variable. You want to distribute you want to distribute a message from the root from the variable node to the factor node and from the factor node to all the loops. This is the first version. The second version is that I want to, my root node is back node. I want to distribute a message from a, a child variable. And then from the child variable, distribute a message to, a, to the to the leaf nodes. So how can we do that? So in the first version, when I, when I want to distribute a message from a variable node to a back node, again, first, because this is distributed, it's not a clap. I do not wait all the Dependent message already. I can first compute the message. But this message from uh, the variable X to the factor. That's the first step, right? And then if F is a loop, that means okay, my distribution should stop. I just stop. I just return. Otherwise, if F still connects to a, a bunch of child variables, I just go, I just enumerate for each child variable and then recursively call the distribution a distribute program, right? The distribute program is just uh, another type of distribute program because this time I have to uh, I have to propagate a message from a factor node to each variable. And similarly, when we look at another version of distribute, a symmetric version of distribute version, when I, when I want to distribute a message from a factor node to a variable, again, because this is a distribute message, right? We don't want to wait. We can first compute the message from a factor node to a variable. And then if x is a leaf, that means we, we have a max the boundary condition we stop. Otherwise, if x still connects to a bunch of uh, factor nodes, then I just go through each child factor node and call the distribute subprogram to pass message from variable node to the factor node. So this will call this uh, version of the distribute subprogram here. Yeah, right? Again, this is kind of a uh, Mutually uh, recursively calling procedure until like all the boundary conditions are met, you finish the you finish the message passing uh, procedure. And uh, um, some 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 of the argument that recursive programming is kind of a resource uh, consuming. Right? You can even 
you can you can do you can do this like without any recursive program as well. You can you can first uh, enumerate the order of the tree and do that as well. It's uh, it's it's, to it's totally uh, not feasible, and but but to me this is, this is the easiest way to increment everything. Right? So as we mentioned, the if if you run the sum product algorithm on the tree structure vector graph, it will guarantee give you uh, the exact solution. But in general, if your graph contains cycles, the sum product cannot guarantee exact inputs. That's kind of a like the uh, 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 abstract things, but uh, but but this is the truth. Uh, if your if your graph contains cycles, then your rule your trick to apply the sum product uh, operation won't be correct. Remember, because the subtrees, if, it, if they can call subtrees, they are connected to each other right? because they are cycles. That means when you move the summation into the product, uh, that, will, that, will be, that will not be correct. Is there an exact inference algorithm on the general graph? There is. Yeah. And this kind of exact inference. Uh, on general graph is called junction tree algorithm. So what is junction tree algorithm? So it's very, uh, you can consider it's kind of the same as the sum product, except that we have one more pre-processing pre step. What is pre-processing step? I first uh, merge the factors. I merge the factors such that I can alter the structure of the factor graph such that they can be more, they can be converted into a tree. Right, because you can imagine that I have a First factor, which connects to two variables, right? I have, I have a second factor, which connects to well, another two variables, right? If I merge these two factors together, I now have a, a new factor, which connects uh, these uh, four variables together. That means your tree structure, uh, your, 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 your crop structure is changed. So if you can smartly merge the factors to turn the initial graph into a junction tree, then I still apply the sample that I want. An interesting question would be like, uh, what kind of uh, a strategy can ensure that you merge the graph to be as small as possible in regards to that? That, that, that is in, in regard to the uh, computational cost. Um, the answer is that uh, such kind of uh, optimal strategy is, uh, is, uh, is empty hard. I mean, you cannot, you can, you cannot find a realistic uh, strategy, a realistic algorithm to search for such, such kind of uh, optimal junction tree. So, so in practice, people usually use some heuristics to construct such, such a tree. And, uh, but there is no free lunch. Even if you can convert your general graph into a junction tree, uh, the competition cost uh, will still be very expensive because we merge the factors. We merge the factors, that means your factor will, come, it will evolve on more variables, right? Remember, when you compute the messages, you need to uh, enumerate all the configurations of the variables associated with that factor. That means the larger the factor, the number of configurations are, uh, the more configurations you have to uh, integrate. Right? So suppose you have like, you have like 10 variables associated with one factor. Each variable takes five possible values. Right? So you have to ignore the five to the 10 configurations. This is very, very expensive. It's actually, um, it is actually uh, exponential to the number of variables associated with the largest factor. So it's not as efficient as you can imagine. So in practice, people, uh, junction tree is not that widely uh, In practice, uh, People just blindly apply some product algorithm on general graphs. Even the graphs have cycles. So this is kind of a, kind of a stupid, but in practice it, it often works really well. So how do we do that? So we first initialize all the messages one, or simply random. You can give it like any random message is fine. And then that means okay, if I want to update any message, I have all the dependent messages. Uh, ready, right? I, j I can just compute whatever I want. And then I just uh, pick up any order to run some part of the product until convergence. That's it. But 
here, we should be uh, aware that the convergence is not always guaranteed. But if it converges, if it converges, uh, and you the result is really good. There are some a bunch of theoretical papers uh, discussing about uh, why, uh, 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 when some product, when we run some product over the, uh, over the, over the cycle, uh, graphs we cycle, so if it converges, what kind of point it represents? It turns out it, it will be uh, some station point for some special type of energy function. And uh, uh, this type of matter is called looped belief propagation. So you can, you can consider like, uh, so there's not a bunch of people, they, they call message as beliefs. They call message passing as belief propagation, but they say they're, they are the same thing. So it's called looped belief, looped belief propagation because your graph kind of cycles. But generally, if you have a, uh, if, you, if your looped belief propagation uh, converges, it works well. It, cor it, it corresponds to some uh, special uh, energy function defined on the graph structures. So it's meaningful. And uh, this looped belief propagation procedure can be considered as a uh, a fixed point intuition. So if you know like the optimization algorithm, you know, uh, in, in in addition to like gradient descent method, which can always guarantee a convergence, right? Uh, there is another type of method called fixed point iteration. So fixed point iteration is quite simple. Uh, but sometimes it can work, it can converge even faster. But but it, 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 it won't always guarantee convergence. So there's a striking uh, uh, connections between multi the propagation and the decoding procedure in information theory, especially the turbo code. The turbo code is kind of, kind of revolutionary um, uh, progress in uh, encoding uh, scheme. 20 years ago? It's not 20 years ago, 15 years ago. So because this is the first coding scheme that approached this general limit, uh, the decoding procedure uh, can be considered as a special piece of uh, so, and then I want to uh, uh, introduce a, a simple extension of the sum product algorithm or max sum algorithm. So remember, we will compute the marginal distribution uh, in addition to, to computing the marginal distribution of your drawn probability. Right? In many tasks, especially in structure prediction tasks, we want to find out the maximum drawn probability. So among all the uh, values of the run, a set of running variables in your uh, graph model, I want to find out the setting of the running variables that maximize the drawn probability. How can we do that? Can we utilize the same kind of procedure? So this task is important. Uh, um, structural prediction tasks such as like uh, post tag, uh, post tagging. Like if you have a sentence and if each word you have a, like a tag. You want to find out a set of optimal tag um, for those sentences. Of course, those tags are interrelated, so they're usually modeled as a, a graph model. I want to find what is the optimal set of tags of each word in your sentence. It's actually you find out a set of tags that maximize the joint probability. How can we do that? So one is thinking like, why not we directly want some product algorithm? Like I can get the marginal. Uh, probability of each node, right? And then I just pick up the setting of the uh, of the variable that maximizes each marginal probability. The answer is uh, 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 is no. We cannot do that because it's really inconsistent uh, with the drawn maximum. So here's a simple example. So here's the drawn probability of this uh, x and y. So both an x, y are binary, and we can see that what is setting for uh, for the maximum drop for the when x and y uh, when, 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 which values when x y are taken will have the maximum drop for the the maximum drop probability is zero point four right that means uh, to achieve this maximum drop probability we'll have to we we'll have uh, x to be one and y to be zero right but if we just calculate the marginal distribution right Say if we calculate the marginal distribution of x, we'll have x is equal to zero, times probability 0 0.6, right? 
and uh, the probability that x be one is zero point four, right? So uh, to maximize the marginal probability, what's the setting of x? Which value of x can can maximize the marginal probability of x? Zero, right? X equal to zero. So you can see that it's totally different from the setting of x that maximizes drop probability. Right? So that means I cannot directly <coughs> find out maximum marginal probability. They cannot be. They usually cannot be used as the uh, estimation of which which can arrive the joint maximum probability, right? And how can we do that? Again, we can look into the uh, the, uh, the, 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 the original example we have a, uh, we, uh, we have a chat, right? So suppose we have a chain of uh, graph models, x1 connects to x2, x2 connects to x3 until x minus 1 connects to x n, right? So we want to maximize the drawing probability, P of X. So it's max over X1 to X, so this is X, X7, P of X. So PX, P of X, according to the graphic model structure, can be decomposed as a, a potential function over X1, X2, potential function over X2, X3, until the potential function over X7 minus 1, X7. Right? So again, we can switch the Max operation and the product operation, right? We do not need to first uh, tackle the whole product and do the maximization, right? Because xn minus 1 xn is independent to, say, x1, x2. So I can first do the maximization over the last potential function, psi n one, psi n minus 1 n, right? And then multiply with, uh, then multiply with uh, uh, last second, second last uh, potential function, psi n minus 2 minus 1, right? And do the maximize. Again and again and again until we uh, arrive at the first uh, uh, potential function psi one two and I maximize it over x two and then it becomes a function of uh, x one and maximize over x one and I get uh, maximum joint probability. So the key operation is that for the max operation coupled with product we still have this distributed wall. So max. The max value of A and B and C is equal to A times the max value of B and C. Of course, you, you need to ensure that A, B, C are positive, right? But in our case, because there are all the probability terms, they must be positive. So how do we do that? How do we calculate the maximum, uh, maximum drop probability? We can simply replace sum by max in the sum product algorithm. That's it. So it becomes a uh, Max product. Right, just, we just want to switch the max operation and the product operation. We want to do the max operation as much as possible before the product operation. So the same idea, exactly the same procedure. Right? But doing this is kind of still uh, it's kind of problematic because remember we're doing product. Right? If you're doing product, uh, um, uh, you are often multiplying uh, many many small factors. And uh, it, it, it easily to arrive at very small values. So to increase the market stability, uh, we usually uh, we usually uh, take a reason. So I want to maximize the drop probability is equivalent to I want to maximize the log drop probability, right? The same thing. So. <coughs> And the distributive, the distributive law still holds. Because the log joint probability will become the log summation, the summation of the log factor, right? So it becomes summation over the factors. Summation over the factors. Oh, oh sorry, it's not summation over the factors. Summation over the log factor. And then, in the outside, you still perform a max operation. So, if you look at, if you couple the max and sum operation, they still have the distributed law. 
So the maximum of a plus b and a plus c is the same as the a plus the maximum b and c. And even better, in this case, it has nothing to do whether a and b and c are positive or negative, right? It doesn't matter. I can always put a, I take a outside and do the maximum between b and c. No matter a and b, c are positive or negative. This is consistent with the logarithm because when you take the logarithm of the factors, you could have like uh, negative terms. So now, how can we adjust the sample of the analog? Okay. So here, we replace sum by max, right? And replace product by sum. That's it. And the other things are the other procedures are exactly the same. Everyone's comfortable? Is anyone there anyone feel uncomfortable about this? So as well, remember, sum product is a field upon this distributed law. If, it, if these two operations satisfy the distributed law, it can be defining all kinds of things. Sum is kind of another name. Okay? The product is another name. As well as these two operations uh, satisfy this law. Whatever operations, you, 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 you can define whatever operations here. Right? So here, uh, all the coupled max and sum operations together still satisfy of the distributed law. So we can define our sum to be max and we the product to be sum. That's it. It's the same thing. And our initial message will be like, because we take logarithm of the factor, right? So when we have a, a, a leaf node, x to the factor node, x only connects to the factor node, have one factor node, then the message from x to f is simply zero. Previously, we, 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 we do not take log just one, right? So we talk, we would take log region, just now it becomes zero, right? And correspondingly, uh, if we have only one factor node, uh, the factor node only connects to one variable node, if you want to compute the message, it is log reason of the factor itself. And then here's the two message passing rules, right? It's just a, uh, uh, you know, Previous is a product, right? So now it becomes up. Previous product becomes up. And this is that this is a logarithm fact because we take logarithm of that. And similarly, when we compute a message from a factor, uh, from a variable to a factor, previous is just product of the message of all the other factors sending to this variable. Right? Now I, I, I replace it by message. I replace it by the summation. That's it. And again, we follow the same, exact the same protocol to pass a message. We first uh, uh, set up a root, and then we collect message from the leaves to the root, and then distribute message from the root to the leaves. All the things uh, remain. And uh, when we terminate, how do we find out the maximum from probability? We can pick up arbitrary variables, x, and then we just sum over all the incoming message, all messages from its neighboring factors, and then do the maximization over x itself. I get the maximum drop probability. So remember, previously we compute this for the marginal distribution of x, right? How can we do that? We just multiply them together. And, and when we do this, when we do, do the summation over this, it's kind of normalization, right? But here we do maximization. So we sum them together, and we pick up the value x which has maximum uh, maximum of this submission, which indicates the uh, maximum drop probability. So another important issue is that uh, although by doing this I can find out the maximum drop probability, but uh, in most cases I, I I would like to know what kind of configurations that lead to uh, this maximum drop probability. Right? What's the corresponding value x that 
uh, of all the variables that can have this maximum drop probability. To know this, we need to uh, we need to uh, augment our mass. We need to augment each message uh, with an actual component. Means that we all we not only need to store the max sub value, we also need to store the variable value that gives the max that gives the max sum, namely the part max. Does it make sense? So here we have these two messages, right? We'll compute just the capital capital maximum value when we integrate all those messages, right? But now we want to trace back which kind of uh, values can lead to the max. We need to store another component. This is the R max. The so same thing. But when I when I compute, I need to uh, I need to not only compute the maximum value, but I also need to compute which set of values of x1 to xm which maximum value. By storing this kind of information, we can trace back all the configurations of the variables that arrive at the maximum value, maximum drop probability. Does it make sense? And similarly, when I when I compute uh, uh, this message from variable to the factor node. I need to store all the part max value as well. Because this message, when I pass this message, I know the part max of the corresponding variables which lead to max value, right? I just combine them together, I got part max here. Does it make sense? Right. And then I can trace back. How can I trace back? So I'll take an example here. This is still a change for our model, right? So at, at every step, we know when a message, when I pass a message from variable node to another factor node or from fractal node from variable node, uh, I know the setting which values of the variables connected to uh, sending the message to this variable node have arrived at the maximum node. So when I, when I arrive to the last message, the multiply together, right? I know, okay, when so xm plus 1 takes 3, the values of these neighboring variables, which can guarantee the message is maximum, is xn takes 3 as well. And then I trace back and, uh, and look at my table and say, okay, when xm being 3, that means this message is maximum. Remember, each, each message. Each message is maximum value, right? When xn is 3, the massive value will be maximum if and only if uh, x uh, minus 1 to be uh, So now we can trace back everything, right? So when you arrive at last message, see, I know I go through all the message values. I know, okay, when xn plus 1 is taken 2, you arrive at uh, Maximum drop probability. Now, okay, I know xn plus 1 must be 2, right? And then I trace back. I know, okay, when xn plus 1 is equal to 2, then xn must be 2 as well to ensure the message, particular message taking, I mean, involving xn plus 1 taking to be 2 will arrive at maximum. xn must be 2. And so similarly, I trace back to xn minus 1. It, it must be 3. And then go back to x minus 2, then it must be a 3 as well. So now we see the configuration. The configuration that arrives at the maximum drop probability will be 3, 3, 2, 2. So this is a this is the key idea. Any questions so far? Does it make sense to Everybody are still a little bit confusing. If you still feel a little bit confusing, uh, you 
Because take a look at the definition here. Take a look at the definition here and uh, consider how they are linked to each other. And uh, maybe next lecture I'll give you, I'll show a different example of that. So, yeah, so the maximum from an algorithm, as well as some for the algorithm, is essentially a dynamic program. So, if this is for hidden markup models, it's known as basically algorithm. Special case of uh, some for that algorithm. And uh, so, so far we have, uh, um, we have, uh, we have gone through the topics in uh, bibliography models. And uh, here are a list of uh, things you need to know. What is the definition of factor graph? What is some product algorithm? What is message passing for Togo? And you need to know some product will be accurate for tree structure graphs, but not guaranteed to be accurate for graphs with cycles. If we, if we uh, apply them blindly in you know, a uh, cycle graphs, we call the loopy blade propagation. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and also works very well, but it does not guarantee convert convergence. If it does not, does not converge, it usually performs very bad. And also, it's extension called max for the algorithm, max sum algorithm. These are, these are only used to find out the maximum uh, the configuration of the random variables and maximize the joint probability. And uh, ho hopefully, after uh, these lectures, you will be able to implement the, this algorithm, although you are not required to implement it. But you should be confident to, uh, to be able to inf implement this algorithm. OK. So uh, sorry for delaying for a few minutes. Okay. So let us continue. Um, uh, first thing.